ask you guys to grab your Bibles or your phones, open up to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This will be the body of the verses that we'll be reading today. So join me as I read. When he entered Caporium again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no room, no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was laying. And seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. But, but some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins? But God alone. Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking, uh, that they were thinking these things in their heart. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. And as a result, they were all astonished and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And so we see that this story takes place immediately after chapter one. This is a continuous of the story. Jesus went away. He healed the, the man of leprosy. And he told the man, don't tell anybody. Just go. Go to the priest, be cleaned, um, have them do the, 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 the ceremony that they do when everybody, um, if you're healed, so you can be welcomed back into society. And the guy with the leprosy was like, forget all that. I'm going to tell everybody and their mama. And then because he did that, there was a big old crowd of people. Like this dude just got healed. You guys remember the man with leprosy. His skin was peeling. It was a different color. Um, and he was exiled. And so now that he's back in there walking around, Skin is fresh, like he just got fresh lotion on, got a tan, he's looking good, and he's telling everybody that's going to draw a crowd. If we told everybody right now that SEC is giving out millions of dollars, you know it's going to be a whole lot of people that come flock to this church right now. And so I could imagine that everybody else wanted to be healed as well. They had been hearing about Jesus do all these miracles and do all these uh, amazing things that now they see him face to face. Now they got a reason to go. So Jesus then, you remember Peter told him, Jesus uh, went away in the wilderness. He just needed to isolate himself, get away for a little bit. And Peter's like, no, stay here. Like, we got this big crowd. Everybody's looking for you. And Jesus is like, no, nah, I need to go do my thing, pray, get refreshed, and then come back. And so now he's coming back to Caporium, and he's entering into this house, uh, which is most likely uh, Simon Peter's house. And there's this big old crowd of people there uh, so much that it locked the door got all these things going on and so I'll give you guys just a quick little bit of how caporium how the house possibly looked that jesus was in right so most of the houses in those times they were one story it was only rare that you've seen a house with two stories like this is a rare house uh in that time and so this was a new testament location it was located in the northeast, uh, northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, right? This is the base option for Jesus. This is where he did most of his ministry was from Caporium. Um, it was a Jewish village, so there was a lot of um, Pharisees, Sadducees. It was, uh, this is where the synagogue was, and it was thriving because of the fishing industry because it was right by the sea, and it was a tax booth, probably the one that Jesus flipped over. <laughs> um, and a lot of the disciples lived there. Um, Peter, Andrew, Matthew, John, James, most of them live there. I want you guys to pay attention to this house, right? Jesus, just picture Jesus in this house. And as you guys can see, it's kind of cut off a little bit, but there is stairs that would lead up to the, to the roof. They had stairs on the outside of those houses that they can go up. And so we read that these, these men carrying this, this paralyzed man on his mat, they couldn't get to Jesus, which tells you a lot about the crowd, that they didn't care about anybody else but themselves. Could you imagine right now if, if somebody came through the door and they're paralyzed and they're trying to get some healing and meet Jesus, 
and they couldn't get through because more nobody moved out the way. This is what was going on. The crowd did not move. So these guys had to think quick and they're like, well, let's just go to the roof. And they go to the roof. Remember, this is not their house. And they just start digging a hole in the roof, tearing her off so we can get this dude down here. That is faith in action right there. That's literally like, ain't nothing stopping us from getting our friend to Jesus. We have to get him to Jesus no matter what. People not moving out the way. They're like, look, man, you ain't coming through here. You're going to have to go around, figure out another way. No, excuse me, he does not apply here. You got to move. And so these guys showing their faith, knowing that they might have not even understood fully who Jesus was. They might have just heard about this guy healing people. And so they said, hey, he's healing folks. We got to get our friend here who's paralyzed to Jesus. They had enough faith to realize that. And so they went above and beyond to get their friend to Jesus. And so this little house could just give you, paint the picture for the story. They go up the stairs and then they start tearing through the roof, start tearing through the roof and lowered their friend into Jesus. And so uh, chapter, well, verses one and two, we read, this is the return of Jesus, and he traveled throughout all the region of Galilee, right? And then um, everything that he did, Jesus always preached. He always preached the word to the crowd. He didn't just do miracles. He didn't just feed people. He didn't just take care of the thing. But what he came to do, he came to preach the word. And so um, after he had traveled through all the region of Galilee, Jesus returned to Caporium, a place that serves as his home during part of his ministry. And when he returns, he quickly draws a crowd. And the one who casts out demons and heals has returned. So this is what the people are chanting. And so Jesus is there. He's preaching to the crowd. And while there was no doubt people that flocked to Jesus for a variety of reasons, Jesus is committed to his mission. And his mission and his message is to preach the gospel just as he's been doing throughout the Galilee. Jesus preached the gospel and gathered crowds, right? We read about that in Matthew, the first chapter, verses uh, 14 and 15, and also in verse 38 of chapter one, right? And so the number one thing that us as Christians can take from this is that we're all called to preach the gospel. Without the gospel, without the message of Jesus, everything else means nothing. Everything else means nothing. We can, we can tell people, hey, man, um, Jesus healed me, and then that could be it. And that's a good thing. But without you sharing the gospel with them, the meaning behind the healing, the meaning of why you're, you're a Christian, right, which I've been challenging some of the guys to write down, what is your why? Why are you a Christian, right? What was the message that you heard that made you want to go to church, that made you want to start reading your Bible, make you spend your hard-earned money on uh, these Bibles, which could be really expensive? What was that? And so we see here Jesus preached the gospel. We can easily do programs like in today. We got programs for, for alcohol, for drugs, homelessness, abuse, all these other things. And those things are amazing and they're great. But those are just life modifications. Without preaching the word to people, there is no real, there's no real healing. There's no real meaning without anything if people aren't spiritually healed. And so Jesus preaching the gospel, he preached it so that people can not just be healed, but that they can have access to go to heaven so they can receive salvation. And while people continue to come to Jesus for many different reasons, we must, as Christians here, we must be faithful in helping people see their true need and what Jesus has done to meet their great need. And that is forgiveness of sins. Amen. And so. As we continue on, verses 3 and 5, we see that these four men displayed a great faith. So what was the faith that they, they did display, right? First thing that they did was that they brought the paralytic to Jesus. These four men believed in Jesus' power to heal. So that's the first and foremost, right? We, we believe, and the next thing that we need to do is we need to tell everybody else about it. Upon hearing Jesus return, and believing in his power, these four men carried this paralyzed man to where Jesus was, and they recognized the man's need, and they believed that Jesus can heal him. So how many people that you guys are around every day that have a need that Jesus can meet? Or you yourself can meet by the grace and 
the position that God has put you in, right? We're all called to serve. We're all called to help. But most importantly, once we receive our forgiveness, it's our job to go and tell everybody else about it. And so this becomes the, the friends. They knew that their friend, this paralyzed man, he's sick. He can't move his leg. He can't walk. He's probably given up on life. Probably heard the message of Jesus because Jesus had been preaching to the whole city. So everybody knows about it. And they didn't just say, ah, oh, man, it's going to be okay, man. Yeah, I'm going to pray for you. And then left him there or maybe even hung out with him for a little bit. But they said, nah, man, we got to do something about this. We got to get our friend here, our brother here, to the man that can heal him. And not just in the, in the vicinity of him. We got to get him directly to Jesus. So their faith in Jesus, maybe they, like I said, maybe they didn't even fully understand who Jesus was at that time. But they seen or had heard everything that he had been doing. And they was like, oh, he can help our friend. Let's get our friend there. And so after that, right, they had a determined faith. Their faith, they had a determined faith, right? It says, while, while the path to Jesus was blocked, these men were undeterred. They knew that the paralytic man needed Jesus, and they were willing to go to great lengths to get him to it. Great lengths to the point of they start tearing a roof in somebody's house, not caring about, man, we probably going to have to pay for this house. Or we're going to have to fix it ourselves or do something. But nevertheless, we got to get our friend here. So they're <laughs> trying to paint a picture of my head, think about some people right now tearing through this roof. Tearing through this roof and just like, oh, just, we got to get our friend right here. And so I could imagine Jesus sitting there. He's preaching and he's God, so he knows what's going on. But the thing starts coming in. Everybody's yelling, hey, man, what these dudes doing up there? They're tearing through the roof. Stuff is falling, hitting people in the head. And they just lowered him down to Jesus. And he's just, he's just sitting there waiting to heal this man, waiting to give him forgiveness. That is an amazing thing. Um, what does that look like in our, in our walk today? What, what great lengths are we going to to get people to Christ? Some people live a long time, well, a long drive away, right? Like the Pachecos, they live about an hour away. Um, a lot of people get in houses, they live 45 minutes an hour. We got another couple, they live like an hour and 20 minutes away. They come here. Um, that is going through great lengths. That if you believe that God has called you to a church to drive an hour, an hour and 20 minutes on a Saturday on your day off to go and hear a message about Jesus. That takes some faith. That takes some real belief. Gas prices are high. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was a 370-something. That's, that's money. That's money and that's time. That's three hours out of your day plus money to uh, go and hear a, a message, an hour sermon, a two-hour service. That takes real faith, dedication. So what do you guys believe in? We do it for our jobs. We do it for, hey, how much they paying? $22 an hour? I'm there. How far is it? Okay, like an hour and a half for me to get there. I'm there every day, every day. But we complain about a one hour once a week drive. So we got to question ourselves. Say, well, man, what is our what? What is our faith driving us to do? Do I really believe in this Jesus that I'm willing to sacrifice an hour? Do I really believe in you know that He's called me to this church to drive that far once a week on a Saturday morning when I could just sleep in? And, and just relax, and then barbecue later. Is your, what, is, what does your faith tell you? Do you have enough faith in that, in God, to do these things? Right. And so, also we see in these texts, we see that Jesus recognized their faith. Jesus recognized their faith. As the man finally reached Jesus, he recognized their faith. And not to say, like I said, that they fully understood Jesus because they might have not had a personal direct encounter with him at that time. They might have just heard a message and heard that he was healing people. But they clearly believed in his power and his ability to heal. So Jesus recognizing their faith, everything that they did, they carried this dude 
Because I remember they didn't have cars, so it wasn't like they loaded them in the car and drove them there. They're either putting them on the camel's back or a donkey, or they're just carrying them, all four of them at the same time, carrying this dude on the mat. I just say he was 6'5", 250 pounds, and they're just chucking along in the, the dirt roads, the, sh the shackles on, maybe they didn't have shackles, and they're just walking, carrying this man, right? Would y'all do that for me if I'm paralyzed? How many of y'all going to walk from my house, which I live four minutes away, car drive from church? Carry me from my house here. Who's willing to do that? You'll drive. <laughs> and so they were determined. They're like, whatever we got to do, we're going to do it. So however big he was, he could have been a big boy. Or he could have been small, but nevertheless, that's still a long time to carry somebody. No car, no nothing. I had to put him down two or three times. Like, hold on, I'm tired. My back hurt. But they were determined. And Jesus recognized their faith. He's like, man, if they went through all of these things to get their friend to me, I'm going to heal them. I'm going to bless them. And so we shouldn't overlook the example of these men. There are people all around us in need of Jesus and of his salvation. And we should be committed to helping those around us see their need and point them to Jesus as the one who, who can meet their great need. We should be going above and beyond for our family members, people that we talk to every day. We have friends that we know are jacked up, that we know that they can, they can die any moment. They're either out there gang banging, or they're on drugs or alcohol, or they're just living this, this crazy lifestyle, going to the club whenever they can. And they have no peace. They're stressed out. What are we doing to meet their needs? How are we meeting them? Right? Some of us in this room going through that stuff right now. How, are we, are we, how we recognize that the people who are around us, even in this church, the stuff that they're going through, have we talked to them and told them about Jesus? Have we went above and beyond to, re to meet their need? This is a question that we, we got to ask ourselves as Christians. The world is the way it is. We can't depend on the government. Some of us still waiting on our tax returns. We filed them two months ago. That ain't going to help nobody. We know that these things, this just don't, they just, government just be bogus sometimes. But what are we doing as people who, as, as uh, Eric was talking about, we're, we're into each other's lives, right? We're transparent. We know the struggles that were going on. How are we helping meet the needs of others? How are we helping them? We opening our doors, those who are homeless people, those who might, you know, need a, a hand up to say, man, um, I am in this place where I just lost my job, lost my house. Or women in domestic violence situation, the dudes are jacked up. He's not willing to help them. They got a brand new baby. Are we, how are we helping them? And in the process of helping them, are we telling them about Jesus? Because without Jesus... It's not that we can help people get to a place where they're financially stable, they get a job, a house. But if they died, are they going to go to heaven or are they going to go to hell? Are we going above and beyond to give people the opportunity to have a real encounter with Jesus? And so we get to this next section, right? Verses 5 and 7, which is the climax of all this, of bringing all this together, just read these verses. Uh, this is the second half of uh, verse 5. It says, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? Uh, God alone. So this is the announcement. This is the big announcement that Jesus it's not going to do. He's going to forgive this guy's sin in front of everybody. And we got those super religious folks. We know about them that are there. They're questioning what's going on. So these are the, the scribes. And in uh, Luke's gospel, it says the Pharisees were there as well. And so we know who the, the, the scribes were. The scribes were the, they were the people who studied the word. They preserved it. Um, and in their questioningness in their heart, they're not necessarily wrong. 
maybe in the beginning of this, they weren't wrong to question, man, who this dude, he's talking about forgiving sins, he's blaspheming, which under the um, Jewish law, he would have been blaspheming because he's making a claim that only God can make. But we know that Jesus isn't just a regular man, he is God. And so he has the rightful uh, authority to make this claim. And then the Pharisees are there. If you read this uh, story in Luke's gospel, the Pharisees were the men who enforced the law to the Jews, right? All 600 plus laws, these Pharisees are all about the laws, the traditions. So these are, they're, the, they're the skeptics. They're like, man, who is this dude? What's he talking about? And they had been watching Jesus for a while. They've seen him heal people. They're, seeing his, they're hearing his message. So they know that, that something's going on with this guy. Who is this guy? And so this was now with Jesus making this claim of forgiving sins, that he's now blaspheming, according to them. And so he's making a claim that only God can make. And so either Jesus is not God and he really is blaspheming, or either he is God. He's telling the truth and he has the right authority to do this. And we're going to see that he is God because he is the one who can really forgive sins. While the paralytic was laying on the ground in front of him, the next words from Jesus aren't words that anyone expected. Jesus pronounced the forgiveness of his sins. And the, um, I'm sorry. So yeah. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. This is the number one thing that all of us as Christians need. In order to get to heaven, we need our sins forgiven. And how are our sins forgiven? By repenting. By repenting. This, paral this paralyzed man, like I say, he may have heard the message of Jesus. He may have not fully understood Jesus and, and who he was and what he was doing, but he had enough faith to know that there was something special about this man that I need to get to him. I need to have some type of encounter with this guy so that I can, my sins can be, so that I can be healed. Number one, he's not even thinking about his sins. He's not even thinking about his sins, but he allowed his friends to bring him to Jesus. And because of that small little face, the faith of a mustard seed, and him recognizing who Jesus was. Jesus says, your sins are forgiving. And this goes to show you that it's not just about physical healing. It's not just about physical healing. Because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, Jesus says that we now have the ability to, to, to speak in prayer healing for folks, right? Um, but the only person who can forgive sins is God. And... And so while Jesus is giving us this, this amazing gift of salvation, he, um, sorry, he forgave them. And so we got the Sadducees, we got the scribes, they're there, and they're questioning God's authority in verses 6 and 7. And the scribes immediately recognized the significance of what Jesus said, that only God can forgive sins. And to wrongly claim that authority is to commit blasphemy. So we see Jesus' authority. In chapter 1, we learned all about it. Um, his sin over, over um, rebuking demons, casting them out, sending them away. He even told the demons to shut up. Don't acknowledge who I was. Uh, don't announce who he was. And so we see Jesus' authority. But now he's having authority to now forgive sins. And these scribes, they don't, they, they're, they're shocked. Their mind's blown. They don't understand it. Um, but they soon will. Jesus is going to explain to them why. And so going into verses 8 through 12, right away Jesus perce perceived in his spirit what they were thinking which goes to show you that Jesus can read minds because they didn't say this out loud. They were thinking this to themselves. What they were thinking, uh, like this within themselves, said to them, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth 
to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately, he got up, took his mat, and went out in front of everyone. To explain this question that they asked to Jesus it may seem odd, or odd question was a way to reveal his authority. Because he could have just said, listen, I'm God, and I have the authority to do this, and that's it. But he asked them a question. It was like, why did he ask them this question? By the divinity of Jesus, pronouncing the forgiveness of sins can be verified by his power of his command to get up and walk. Uh, it is very much verifiable. So Jesus tells these guys, hey, listen, what is easier for me to do? Is it easier for me to get up and just tell this man, hey, your sins are forgiven, or for me to get up and tell him to walk? What's the easier thing to do? Is to tell him that your sins are forgiven. And nobody else can tell this guy to get up and walk and that he's going to walk. It's easy to say that your sins are forgiven because you don't have to see anything. Easy just to, to say that, hey, yo, you know what, Brian, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven, man. I'm out. But nobody knows anything what, what's going on after that because you don't see anything. It's just words. But where his authority comes in is that he tells the man, he just talks to him and says, get up, take your mat, and walk. Now that takes authority. That takes power. So this is why Jesus asks him that question. And then he verifies it by the man getting up and walking. The healing of the baptized man, as we've seen before, the healing power of Jesus is immediate and completely effective. But this wasn't like the man gradually over a period of time got up and walked. He instantly got up and walked. We don't know how long this guy had been paralyzed, what caused him to be paralyzed. But what we do know is that he was paralyzed. And immediately when Jesus speaks to him, he gets up and he starts to walk. But what does that say about us? What does that say to us is that when Jesus does something in our life, it takes place immediately. When he tells us that we're forgiven, when he tells us that we're saved, it's not a progressive salvation. Some of us be like, man, I'm still, you know, I'm still going through the motion or I'm still, uh, still trying to figure this out. No, you're saved. The moment that you confess your sins, you repent of those sins, you are then saved that very minute. This is the, the amazing gift. It's not like, well, Jesus is like, yeah, I'm going to forgive you. I got to see how you're going to do next week or over the next week. And we might make mistakes. We might slip up. Some of us men might slip up, lust, get angry, curse, yell at somebody, do something crazy. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. That just means that we got to get disciplined. <laughs> we got to get some discipline in those areas that we struggle, okay? And so just because you now confess your sins, that doesn't mean that you're now perfect. Now you're going to live this amazing, holy life that you're going to be floating when people see you. You're just going to be, what's the, what's the scene from uh, <laughs> Dave Chappelle when Prince walks in, he's like, he's floating. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Nah? Ah, okay. <laughs> but anyway, it's a pro um. You're instantly saved. So we see that God instantly does things. So when he tells the man he's healed, he's instantly healed. He gets up. He walks. He's blowing these people's minds. They're like, what the heck is going on? This dude just got up and walked. Um, and everybody's rejoicing. And so I'm going to read something. But uh, yeah, so it shows Jesus' authority. Um, it's immediately and it's completely effective. It's not that he got up and he walked and then one leg was working, the other one wasn't. He didn't have to take any medicine. He didn't, they didn't have to you know, put poles in his legs or anything like that. It was instantly healing. The man got up and he walked. So this is a complete sign of authority because nobody else here or back then without the Spirit of God in you, will be able to tell anybody to get up and walk, to get up and, and, and go. And so, what does this mean for us, right? 
Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. The authority of the Son of Man. I almost skipped over this part. The authority of the Son of Man. What did we just hear about the Son of Man a few weeks ago on a Wednesday? Daniel chapter 7. <laughs> Daniel chapter 7. We, we're going through the book of Daniel. Y'all know that. Chapter 7, it talks about the Son of Man. And so that's where that, that title comes from. And that's why they were able to understand that reference when Jesus makes it. Right? And he says, what does he say? And he says that, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. They would have known what that reference, the Son of Man, meant. Because uh, especially the scribes and the Pharisees, because these are the studiers of the word. Um, and so that title is significant, right? It's a sign of authority. And they, they recognize that. So our greatest need is forgiveness, and Jesus is the one through whom forgiveness is available. Without Jesus, there is no forgiveness. Without what he did on that cross, there is no salvation. We must trust him for our forgiveness and then point others to him for their needs as well. So the, the task, the, that's what the Great Commission comes from. The task is not just to get saved and then we tuck it away. We go into our homes or with our families and then that's it. But it is to let everybody know that they're all, they all need forgiveness. Our friends, our parents, everybody. Everybody is in need of the forgiveness of sin and what that, what that power is. So we get to this final verse, and this is the response to Jesus' authority. This is how we all should respond every day, all the time. It should be our response, especially as soon as you receive salvation. It says, as a result, they were astonished and gave glory to God. I'm going to say that again. As a result, they were astonished and gave glory to God, saying they have never seen anything like this. They were astonished and they gave glory to God. So our acceptance of forgiveness, we should be astonished. We identify God's authority. We should give glory to God. Not just the four men, not just the paralyzed man. But everybody who was around them at that time, they gave glory to God. And that should be a reflection of our lives. Our lives, we should give glory to God. Everything that we do on our jobs, in our homes, the way we treat our spouses, at work, driving trucks, dealing with people that get on our nerves, or, or we seem to take what they said as a form of disrespect. It should be glorify God. Our speech, our character, our conduct to glorify God, right? And it's because of God forgave me for my sins. He forgave me for my old lifestyle. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to commit my life to him. I'm going to try to be the very best Christian that I can possibly be because of who God is and what he's done for me. He forgave me. He forgave me of, of, of my sinful ways. So I don't need to go back there. I don't need to meditate on it. I don't need to dwell on that. The past is the past. I'm letting it go, and I'm living a new life now in Christ. And I'm going to go from living a life of shame and sin to now glorifying God. Glorifying God. How many of us today live a life that glorifies God? When we got, when we got saved, there, there should be a, a passion, right, that took place. Even if you're, you're an introvert, there should be such a passion that, man, I received what God has given me. Now I'm going to live for him. Now I want to tell the world about him, right? I want to tell everybody, their mamas, their grandmamas, kids, babies. I want to tell everybody about what God has done for me, right? I want to live my life to glorify God so that everybody sees it. And so, in closing, right, read this last verse. I'm sorry, I didn't add it to the thing, so I'm going to just read it from my Bible. 
verse 12, the second part of verse 12, it says, Again, it says, saying, we have never seen, wait, it says, immediately, let me read the whole verse. Immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. And as a result, they all were astonished and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this before. These people were amazed. They had never seen anything like that. They had never seen a man get up and, and heal. They had never seen another man claimed to have authority to forgive sins. And because they they seen that and they received it, they gave glory to God. Everybody who was there, thousands of people, remember this house was surrounded to the point where nobody can even get through the front door. So they had to go to the roof. So imagine this building that we're in, we're in a small building, just surrounded by thousands of people. Somebody gets saved, somebody gets healed, everybody sees it see this guy get up and walk and everybody is now glorifying God everybody because of one person does it so Brian when you go out and you tell people your testimony about what God has done for you they should be able to see that in your life they're going to give glory to God for that man Brian used to do x y and z he used to be this way and that way but now he's living for Jesus now he's spiritually healed now he's physically healed he got this glow about him. His skin looks good. His hair's cut. He's getting haircuts now. He's dressing better. God is doing something in his life. <laughs> and so people see that and they're like, well, I want to know about this, this God that he's serving. And that's your invitation to invite them to church. Your invitation to share the gospel with them. And once you do that, they should give, not only you giving glory to God through your life and how you're living, they should give glory to God as well. You guys glorify the Father together. So while the crowd did not have a complete understanding of who Jesus was, they were amazed and they knew that God was the one who deserved the glory. And as those who have seen Jesus for who he is and have experienced his forgiveness, we shall likewise, everybody here in this room, be amazed and give God glory. Every day he's doing something new in our lives. Every day we, we, we see God and how amazing he is. We can meditate on the news. I believe my, Monica said in which they were doing pre-service prayer that there is good, is it good in every day? How did you say that? You don't remember? Yeah, every day isn't good, but there's good in every day. Thank you. And so the, we should definitely glorify God for all the good because there's definitely a lot of evil in this world. There's babies and, and people dying, people carjacking, people getting robbed, people dying from sicknesses and diseases. But we know for the goodness that we personally receive from God every day that we should glorify him just for waking up in the morning. Some people woke up, didn't wake up this morning. And so, as, as, as we close, as we wrap this up, I want to just challenge everybody here to recognize that we all have, we're all spiritually paralyzed. At one point in our lives, or we go through things where we're, we're, we're living for Jesus, right? But we're going through some stuff. We may have backslide, or we might just have a season of doubt, a season of confusion. And we all need to be, have this, this spiritually paralyzed state stricken from us. What this story shows, shows us is that our spiritual need is greater than our physical need. Why did Jesus forgive him of his sins before he healed them? Why did Jesus say that your, son, your sins are forgiven? Now get up and walk. He could have just said, hey, get up and walk. I'll see you around. But he told him that his sins were forgiven because we are all in need of our sins to be forgiven so that we can have this eternal relationship with the Father. We want to pray. 
us out. And I want to let you guys know that these altars are open if you guys need prayer. If you guys are struggling, dealing with anything, you need healing, uh, sickness, financial struggles, jobs, or you just need the fire to be reignited inside of you, to have that passion again for the Lord, for what he's trying to do through you to the world. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for waking us up and allowing us to get to church to hear about your son, Jesus, and what he's done for your children. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise for everything that you have done and everything that you are doing in the people's hearts not just here in Squad Community Church, but in this neighborhood, throughout Chicago, the world. Even though if we just watch the news, it seems dark. It seems like there is no hope for anything. Lord, we know that in you, that there is hope. We know that in you, there is healing. We know that in you, that there is forgiveness, that we can have a new life in Christ. So, Father. We love you and we thank you. I want to pray for anybody who is dealing with any issues. Come to this altar and meet Jesus and allow him to heal you from the inside out. Allow him to take on those burdens. Allow him to forgive you of that sin that you're struggling with. Cast it all on him today. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you. We give you glory, the glory that you deserve, Father. Amen.